Everybody, welcome to week one of our uh, Prepare the Way series. Uh, we are working our way through the Bible. I know y'all hear me preach, you're like, man, he says this every week. I do. I'm sorry. I want everybody to be on the same page. So forgive me for that. If you're joining us online, hi, good morning as well. We're so glad that you're with us. But uh, yeah, we're, jo- we're uh, starting our series, Prepare the Way. This is uh, part five of an eight-part series as we're reading through all of the Bible together, kind of in a chronological sense. Uh, We're also on our reading plan. We're going to be on week 23. So if you're uh, reading along with us or doing any of the reading or scripture memory, we're going to be in there. But uh, basically, we're at the end of the Old Testament. We're at the place where the only thing really left is the prophets that are preparing the way for the message of Jesus to come. So that, that's where we're at. We're going to be looking in the book of Isaiah today. And uh, Isaiah is a prophet of God. Um, and there's a, probably a lot of verses you are familiar with in Scripture that come from Isaiah. And um, he, he just got to experience a lot of big things in the presence of the Lord. Um, but let me ask you this. How many of you have ever just been in a place where you really wish you could just have like a visual confirmation of God even for a moment? You just like, look, I just, it, would be, it would make my life so much easier if I could just see him real quick, know he's there, and then it takes care of all the doubts, all the fears, everything else. Oh, you're there, great, you're good. Um, how many of you have ever seen with kids, uh, like they're scared when they think their parent's gone, but all the parents got to do is just like wave at them, that, okay, I'm good. Like once they can see a parent's presence, once they can see that they're not alone, it changes the whole dynamic of how they respond to everything. Well, for us, a lot of us, we've been in this place where at times of doubt, at times of fear, we've wished we could see God in person. And uh, out of scripture, there weren't a lot of people on this side of eternity that saw God up front and in person ahead of time, but uh, Isaiah is one of those. But uh, as we're jumping into this, we're going to be looking at Isaiah's role as a prophet in preparing the people for the presence of God now, or the kingdom of God as it's coming, as Jesus is making his way uh, to earth in a human form to die on the cross for our sins. As we're moving this, it was the prophet's job to prepare everybody for that. And how many of you know that preparing for something hard usually isn't easy itself? Like, uh, I know Miss Lynn, you just ran, what, six miles for a race yesterday? She's been preparing for that, and now she told me she's about to prepare for 13, right? Yeah, so that's not an easy process, but to prepare for something. Now, Mr. Meekins, He's a gangster, and he does all sorts of like athletic stuff that he prepares for way harder than I can. You know, he he wins awards and you know crushes the game with all the stuff that he does in his athletics. Stuff. But I know that it's a constant preparation for things. Um, my daughter uh, Rosa played uh, trom- trombone at a at Carnegie Hall a couple weeks ago, and uh, my house for a hot minute was just a single trombone like sounded like geese being slaughtered to me because I was one part of a big symphony but she spent a lot of time preparing for it the prophet's job wasn't always to give people messages that made them happy the prophet's jobs weren't always to give them stuff that they wanted to hear because you know a lot of popular preaching right now the stuff you know that you want to save on Instagram or the stuff you're like, ooh, that's good, let me retweet that or something like the stuff that's good. That stuff is usually stuff that makes us feel good or like, mm, that's a good point. I like that. I feel better about me. The prophets didn't get to do that. The prophets didn't get to preach the stuff that would, you know, sell a book or a t-shirt. The prophets stuff that they preached was the stuff that was going to hurt your feelings and that you wouldn't want to hear. But it was their job to preach this stuff in order to prepare the people for what God was going to come. And on most of the prophets, if you read through them, through uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, those guys, the major prophets, the minor prophets, all of them together, one of the main messages that you heard was this, uh, prepare yourself, prepare yourself for judgment, and prepare yourself for a Savior to be come, that's going to come. How many of y'all honestly want someone to say, hey, get ready, you're going to be judged? Israel didn't want to hear that, and you know, most prophets probably didn't want to deliver that message. But Isaiah was a prophet that that was his responsibility. Now, just for some context, Isaiah served as a prophet to the kingdom of Judah. Remember, if you've been following through us with, as the, we're reading through the Old Testament, uh, the, a couple of weeks ago as we were teaching, the nation of Israel split in half, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Uh, the, uh, Isaiah was a prophet for the southern kingdom of Israel for 53 years. 
So he spent, you know, more than enough time to get his, you know, retirement plan as a prophet for that. Um, he began his ministry 120 years after Elijah and 50 years after Jonah. So as uh, Pastor David preached last week, as we were talking about Jonah, this is about 50 years after what we talked about last week. Um, it's been 200 years since the kingdom split. And this, just to put this in context for what we're going to say, this is 700 years before Jesus shows up in earthly form, walking around Jerusalem, okay? So it's 700 years. Now, if you're saying, why is, it gonna t- why is somebody preparing a way for 700 years before something happens? I mean, we think, you know, America's a young country. We're under 300 years old in terms of country. Like, literally, people were preparing the way for Jesus and his arrival more than twice the lifespan of this country so far. You're like, why would you, pre- like, is anything affecting your life today that somebody was preparing 300 years ago? Probably, you just don't realize it. Um, <laughs> and what Isaiah was doing, he was preparing for uh, Jesus to come. And one of the things, too, this isn't going to be in the message, and I'm just going to give you this as a side note because it's one of my favorite pieces of scripture. Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus showed up, gave one of the most detailed accounts of what Jesus' life was going to look like 700 years in advance. Uh, read Isaiah 53, just that chapter, just that one chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus shows up, gives literally a whole depiction of Jesus' life, death, and what it was going to accomplish. 700 years before Jesus was here in earthly form, because he got to deliver some good news with that as well. But as we're going into this, we're going to spend a good chunk of time in uh, Isaiah 6. But, uh, you know, we're in this place where, uh, if you look during Isaiah's ministry, uh, there were four kings. Uh, he was a prophet through four different kings. Uh, Uzziah was one of the main ones. Um, jo- Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. But during this time, uh, Israel had, he had witnessed the fall of the northern kingdom um, to the Assyrians. And uh, they had seen, you saw how things were with Jonah last week and the fact that Israel was in a better place to the point they could actually reach out to other nations. But something that we're, as we're getting in here, God didn't send Isaiah as a prophet because they were having hard times. In fact, at this point in time, Israel was having, having a time of prosperity. They were better financially than they had ever been since Solomon. They were better in a military sense than they had ever been as a nation. So at this point in time, Israel was stronger on the outside from the appearance than they had ever been. But how many of y'all know when we get comfortable is when we get lazy? When, we, when, we, when everything's working together, that's usually when we stop trying so hard. And um, at that point in time, just like when Solomon was over Israel, just like when Jeroboam was over Israel, the prosperity and security led to spiritual decay. Because they had money, because they had land, because they had security, because they had leadership, because they had everything that they needed, they started to spiritually decay. And I don't know about y'all, but when I'm comfortable, when I don't have stuff that I'm struggling for is usually when things kind of fall apart. And um, this is just a side note, just something that was really hitting me when I was reading over this. If we can't handle success and comfort without turning away from God, we're probably never going to have it stability as a stable facet in our lives. Because one of the things that we see so often is that when we get comfortable, usually it takes something falling apart for us to tra- turn around and keep our eyes on God. Something has to break for us to say, oh, you know, hold up, maybe I should put God into this. And if we can learn as a people to be able to have a place of comfort and still keep our eyes on God, I bet our lives will go a little bit smoother. Just maybe. Just maybe that'll work out better. But uh, Isaiah is one of the strongest prophets in his teaching, and one of the reasons why is Isaiah saw God. You remember I was like asking earlier if you, what would happen if you saw, Isaiah actually saw God. He got to see a glimpse of who God was, and I'm going to tell you that, you know, that would change you. Don't you think if you literally saw even a fraction of who God was in person, you'd be like, okay, I'm good. You know, I don't need to see anything else. (laughs) I got you. I'll listen. Thank you. Um, But check out Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. 
it says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. So this is like saying, in the year that the king died, Isaiah saw the Lord, and he saw him, and it said that, uh, verse 1, it said that he was high and exalted, seated on a throne. And so you imagine this, he gets a glimpse of God sitting on a throne, and it says, the train of his robe filled the temple. In Isaiah 6, verse 2, it says, above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces. Now, so not only did he get to see a glimpse of God, he saw angels. How many of y'all are like, oh, I'd like to see angels? No, you don't. You don't want to see angels. Because what we see as angels, we think, you know, little cute fat babies with wings. We think, you know, people like Castiel on Supernatural. Or we think, you know, people in Hallmark movies that turn out to be parts of Christmas. Nah, angels were scary looking. Angels were hideously beautiful, and you don't want to see one. Like, you see one, because what's the first thing an angel usually has to say to somebody? Don't be afraid. Fear not. You know why they have to say that? Because they're fearing. Because they're scary. Um, and it says, so listen to this, the seraphim is it's describing in verse 2. Above him were the seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two wings they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. Um, it's just like, first of all, you don't usually see depictions in the world of angels with like six wings and covering their faces, and it's just it's creepy. Um, verse 3 says, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So he saw an image of God, a depiction of God on a throne. His t- his, the train of his robe was filling the entire temple. And there were angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. And when they were saying these things, the whole place was shaking. Imagine that. Just literally, just take a moment in your mind, picture what it would look like for you to see God on a throne, the train of his robe filling this place, and angels crying out, holy, holy, and the whole place shaking like an earthquake. I don't think you'd be the same after that. I don't think you would walk out of that situation the same. And, um, you know, maybe you're going to be one of those people that see this on this side of eternity. Maybe you're, maybe you're going to be one of those people that have those type of encounters. I, you know, personally, I think I'm good. I don't, it's like, I believe, you, I believe you're there, God. I'm like, don't, don't show me the scary stuff. I'm all right. Um, some of us want that. But one of the things that we're going to look at today is what happens when you actually meet God. Now, we meet God, obviously, without having to see him in that full glory, without angels causing earthquakes. We meet God in our lives as we are. But one of the things that we're going to see as a reference with Isaiah here is what happens when we meet God, how, what happened with him, but what also what happens with us. Um, so one of the first things that we're going to see when we meet God is this. If you meet God personally, you will discover his holiness. The only thing that Isaiah heard when he was in the presence of God, was holy on repeat. Not just once, not just, you know, like a quiet whisper of like, hey, he's holy. You know, it was literally holy, 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 and they were crying it back to each other because that's the essence, that's the determination of who God is because holy as God is, is holier than we've ever actually been a part of. Have you ever met somebody that was doing something that was just made you think of, oh, I'm not on their level? Like, you meet somebody that does something you do, and you're like, mm, we're not the same. I'm not on that person's level. Like, uh, I was sitting, I was about to, right before I walked in during worship, I heard uh, Gary going off on the guitar. And here's something I play the guitar, but I don't play the guitar like Gary. I, I've got a, a uh, you know, I've got an acoustic guitar. I'm like chuk 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 chuk, like you know, I've got some chuk a chuggas like with my, you know, I've got a rhythm that can it's pretty decent, but nothing that I do on a guitar sounds like what Gary does. I'm like, oh, we're not the same. And then you see people that you know, like you know, oh, I exercise. Then you see people who exercise. You see people who cook, and then you see people who really cook. You know, like I can microwave a hot pocket. You. 
do stuff with like French pastry and stuff that I don't understand. People are on different levels. When we actually see God, we're going to realize that everything we've understood of what holiness is, isn't holy enough. That God's holiness is on another level. And there's a reason why the angels are crying it back and forth in threes. Three's a number of perfection. And they were just crying it back and forth because God's not just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. Like he, is the, he is more than what our understanding of holiness is. And it's such a glorious and scary thing all at the same time. There's not a lot that we can experience in this life that kind of expresses what that is. But one of the things that scripture kind of uses to describe who God is and the level of his holiness and just the level of who he is. uh, How many of y'all ever seen a fire and you just thought that you were just, how many of y'all like fire, by the way? You know, obviously we don't want natural disasters and stuff that's going to hurt us, but we enjoy watching a fire. We enjoy how powerful fire can be. When you see a big fire, it's beautiful and terrifying. Now, most of us, we don't enjoy fire if it's involving our homes or things like that, obviously. But when you see a fire in its big natural scale, it's, it's beautiful. And, but it's also terrifying because you know you don't want to touch it. You don't want to be near it because you know just even being near it is dangerous. The same thing with some things that are powerful, thunderstorms. How many of y'all like watching thunderstorms? Like, it's, you know, personally, ever since I was a kid, if there's a thunderstorm, I'm going to sit on my front porch. Like, you know, I'm going to sit on the front porch, watch it, and, you know, I'll be out there, and I'll be like, oh, that's so beautiful. But occasionally, there'll be a strike. I was like, Mm-mm, that's too close. Going inside. Y'all, y'all have those moments where it's like literally like, oh, that, that mm-mm, got to go. I like it when it's at a safe distance. But when it's up close to me, I realize it's too much for me. And y'all, that's what the holiness of God is like. It's like a raging fire. It's like, a, it's like lightning. It's beautiful and powerful at a distance, but the closer we get, the realize we, it's more powerful than us. Some of the scripture that actually refers to God you know, as a fire, uh, Hebrews 12.9 refers to God as a consuming fire. Not just a burning fire. It's a fire that literally will eat up everything. Uh, Luke 3.16 says, uh, John the Baptist tells the people that uh, when Jesus is revealed, it says that he will baptize them with a Holy Spirit and with fire. It says, John answered them all, I will baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, not that I'm critiquing John's, you know, speeches or anything, but, uh, you know, if, if for just him to be able to out there preaching, he's like, when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That sounds pretty powerful, right? But he's like, nah, and fire. It's like, these people didn't, might not have understood what the Holy Spirit meant. But it, when he said, he's going to baptize you with fire, everybody's like, oh, like that's, it has an effect to it. And God is that raging fire that Jeremiah, one of the other prophets we're talking about, Jeremiah 20 verse 9 describes God as a burning fire shut up in his bones. He says, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore his name, his word in my heart like a fire, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. He says, listen, God's word is in me like a burning fire and I can't keep it in. God's description as fire is used over and over because this is something that people can understand. Even if they can't understand his holiness, they can understand what a burning fire, a raging fire is like. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 um, tells us as we're reading through that, that everything we build, that everything we do in our life is going to be tried by fire. That it's going to be tested against fire. Because, you know what, when something is burned, there's only the purest stuff, the strongest stuff is going to last. Everything else is going to become ash. It says, for no one can lay foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on his foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light, and it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If, it is built, if, if what is built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as only one escaping through the flames. Again, all of this talk, as we're reading through it, describes what God does as part of you know, fire. Exodus 2, y'all are familiar with the burning bush, how God spoke to Moses there. Exodus 40, verse 38, when he guided Israel, he guided them with what? 
in the day he got in them with, you know, in the day he got him with smoke, but in the night he got him with a pillar of fire. God's presence is often described using fire because it's one of the closest things we can see in this lifetime that mirrors his holiness. When it comes to powerfulness, when it comes to fear, it's one of the closest physical descriptions we can see. Another thing that, you know, as we talked about the lightning, the thunder, uh, that's used often as well. Job in chapter 37 verses 2 through 5 says this. Um, Listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the, earth, the ends of the earth. After that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with his majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. So just as it was described, his, you know, him as fire, it also applies with thunder, with lightning. Um, 1 Samuel 2.10 says, Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from the heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to the king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Even David used it as thunder and you know, lightning. Psalm 29, verse 3 through 8 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the, in, in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. Let me just ask you this. How many of y'all can make a, like a good impression of lightning or thunder? You just like you guys think like you know I can make a great lightning sound or thunder sound. Anybody, anybody feel like they can make one that does does a due diligence of it? Like it sounds like yeah, that's really accurate. Um, when I was doing Wizard of Oz, like I was supposed to roar really one time, and I'm like I, I was practicing. I was like, oh, I'm terrible at this. Nothing I do sounds like a legit roaring lion. So like the one time I did, I just went roar. Like I'd literally said roar. And I was like, I laughed about it every time I was doing it because I was like, I can't do anything sounds like it. Nothing we can do will effectively imitate lightning or thunder. In the same way, God's holiness is not something that is just imitatable. It's either part of us in, or present in our lives or it's not because we can't imitate him can't imitate it. Ask a little kid to tell you what lightning sounds like or what thunder sounds like. And just listen, because that's what it looks like when we try and imitate God's holiness without it actually being present in our life. It makes a difference. Um, you can, but this is something that we have to understand that when we see God's holiness, it can be part of our lives or it can be something we ignore and run away from. But when Isaiah saw God's holiness, when he saw the presence of God, it changed him. And look at what he said in Isaiah 6, 5 through 7, going back to the passage we were in. It says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Of my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. He said, I'm going to die. <laughs> He said, my life is over. I've seen what God's look, God looks like, and I can't compare to that. I'm going to die. He literally said, oh, I've seen too much. I'm going to die. He said, I, I, this is beyond me. I can't be a part of this. He Literally, the presence of God showed him that it was beyond who he was. Verse 6 says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had, held, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched it to my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. When Isaiah saw how holy God was, he realized I am sinful and I can't be here. He didn't ask God to forgive him. He didn't ask God to fix it. He just said, I don't deserve to be here. And you know what God did? He sent an angel over and purified his sins. Now, most of us don't want like a hot coal stuck in our face or anything like that, but that's like how God did it at that approach. 
people over to purify Isaiah in that moment. And let me tell you this. Most of us fear God's holiness just because we realize we can't do it on our own. But when we recognize God's holiness and we recognize that we can't do it on our own, that's the beginning of us actually finding holiness in ourselves. When we realize we can't do it is when God starts to do the work. Because all Isaiah did was recognize that he wasn't holy and watch what God did. When we recognize that he is holy and we are not, y'all, that's the first step towards salvation. That's the first step towards repentance. That's the first step towards actually being in a place where we're... And so here's the second thing. If you meet God personally, you will acknowledge your sinfulness. If you really meet God, you're going to acknowledge that not only is he holy, but you're not. Because when we meet God, it actually shows us how messed up we are, how sinful we are, how uh, just broken and ugly some of the things in our hearts and lives can be. Um, Y'all ever seen like a big wine stain on a wedding dress? It's kind of noticeable, isn't it? You, you see something like that? There was a, you know, I DJ a lot of weddings and I officiate a lot of weddings and uh, I saw a wedding one time. I was there for the rehearsal. We were going through all the things, preparing all the stuff. And during the rehearsal, uh, the bride was showing her wedding dress off to her bridesmaids. And one of the bridesmaids' moms, not even somebody in the wedding party, somebody just came over and literally, oops, whole glass of wine down the front of her wedding dress. And that young lady sat there and cried for like an hour. And nothing you could do at that point. Like, literally outside of put like a big froofy like bow down the front of her wedding dress, she like cried, got her tears out. She's like, all right, just going to go with it. She walked down the aisle the next day, big wine stain down the front of her dress, didn't try and hide it, didn't try and cover it up, didn't put flowers over it, didn't put a bow over it. She's like, it is what it is. I acknowledge that this is here, and I can't change it. When, <laughs> I see your face. I'm with you. It was horrible. <laughs> um, but that's the reality, y'all. When we acknowledge our sinfulness, we also acknowledge we can't change anything or cover it up. The only thing we can do is accept it and move forward with it. When we realize how sinful we are, the only thing we can do is confess it and move forward with it. Because the reality is God's light is so holy, his light is so bright that it exposes every dirty part of ourselves. I travel a lot uh, doing Comic Cons and camps and stuff like that, and one of the things I like to do is bring a big bright flashlight when I check into hotel rooms. Because um, I don't trust hotel lighting. So hotel lighting be co can be covering up some stuff. So I'll come in there with a big light, look under everything, look under the, before I ever sit down on the bed, I lift the sheets, look for bed bugs, do the whole thing, I'm double checking. You know, I'll carry my own can of disinfectant, like hit all that stuff, because I'm looking for where the imperfections are before I commit to that. And, um, cause I gotta be on a budget. <laughs> and sometimes, and I go some places I don't really wanna be. Um, and when we notice that our God's holiness puts a, a light on every imperfection in ourselves. And part of our, our response can be to hide from that or to try and cover it up. But the reality is when he shines an, a light on our imperfections, that's just a step for him to actually work in us and to bring us into his presence. Because God wants us with all of our brokenness. He, we don't have to hide. But if we don't acknowledge what's broken, he can't help. Y'all, Any of y'all stubborn don't want to go to the doctor because you don't want to find out something's wrong? That's me, every day, all day. I don't want to go to the dentist every year because, like, you know, I'm waiting. They're going to tell me I got a cavity. I know it. I know it. I walk out of there without cavities, feeling like I know I'm, like, over 40 and still get excited when I don't go to the dentist and don't have cavities. I'm like, do do? like, like, like can, I get a, can I get a lollipop? Can I get something? Like, I, can I get an award? Because I'm, you know, didn't have cavities. We, we all want to be in this place where we, uh, where we don't acknowledge what's wrong. But that's only where we can find healing. 1 John 5, verse 10. Um, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10 says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. You hear that? The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Verse 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Y'all, one of the biggest things we can do to hinder our spiritual life is to act like we're okay. Like that we're not sinning, that we're not struggling, that what we're doing is not wrong. And most often, spiritually, we'll keep bouncing around place to place, relationship to relationship, church to church, until we find somebody that's not going to point out that what we're doing is wrong. Because we don't want to actually grow. We don't want to repent. We just want to go somewhere where somebody's not going to actually look at what we're doing. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Remember back when Isaiah spoke about his unholiness, that he was unclean? He confessed that he was unclean, and God purified him. It's the same way with us. If we actually can point out what's broken in us, if we can point out what's sinful in us, if we can point out where we fall short, God can handle it. God is not afraid of your failures. God is not afraid of your sins. God is not afraid of your mistakes. Some of us, we, we feel like as long as our sin stays hidden, we can still pretend like everything's okay. God's grace can handle our biggest, boldest public sin. Now, sometimes Christians really are terrible about that, that we're fine loving people until they actually confess out loud that they've sinned, and then we want to act like we're surprised that sinners sin. Remember I spoke before the service started that loving others literally completes the law of God, as it said in Romans 13. Y'all, loving others means that when people confess their sins, we embrace them and encourage them not condemn them and act surprised and judgmental. There's a difference there. So when we confess our sins, God's response is to bring redemption. And here is uh, in Isaiah 6, verse 8, notice what happens here. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Now, if you look at this interaction, the Lord didn't speak to Isaiah until he confessed his sins and he was purified. He heard angels before that, but the voice of the Lord spoke to Isaiah when he confessed his sins and was purified. Some of us, we're waiting for God to speak in our lives. We're waiting for God to move in our lives and God's waiting us for a turn from our sin and turn towards him. He's like, I've got stuff for you to do, but I'm waiting for you to get in the right place first. Not to fix ourselves, but to get in the right place of saying, God, I can't fix this on my own. Please help me. Um, one of our church members are out of town right now, so I'm picking up their packages. And uh, Carmen, if you've met my smallest human, she's like this high. And they got a package the other day that was literally about six feet tall. About this thick and six feet tall. And, you know, I wasn't in a rush, so I felt like, you know, giving my kids life lessons. And um, so I said, hey, Carmen, go get that package off that porch and put it in the car for me. And she's just like, what? I'm like, no, I believe in you. You can do it. So I just stood there and watched as my small midget of a human, like, tried to drag this six-foot package down some steps, and then she got it down there, and she's trying to pick it up, and she's, like, trying to, like, literally, she didn't even want to, like, slide it. She felt like she had to carry the whole thing, and I just watched her struggle, Um, and it wasn't heavy. It was just big, and I watched her struggle, and I watched her get frustrated. I watched her, like, get red and angry at it, and I saw her just, I watched her. I was like, and she's just doing this. I said, would you like help? She's like, yes. I was like, well, why didn't you ask for it? And she's like, oh, okay. 
Will you help me? I'm like, sure. And we picked it up, went on about our day. And some of us, we're in this place where you might have been, you might be in a situation because of your choosing. You might be in a situation because of your mistakes. You might be in a situation because of others. You might be in a situation because God put you there. The reality is, until we actually go to God with what we're struggling with, he, he's not going to be able to use us until we're in that place where we're submitting to him. So then he heard the voice, vo- voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah jumped up. He said, And I said, Here am I. Send me. So the last uh, thing that happens when we actually meet God personally, if you meet God personally, you will have a desire to declare others, or declare him to others unconditionally. You're going to have a desire to actually share him with others. How many of y'all have ever been in a place where, you know, somebody meets a celebrity or somebody they're really enamored with or famous, and they just want to show you, hey, look, just look who I met. And they'll post on social media if you run into them in the grocery store, look who I met. They're really excited about stuff like that. Some people, it might be a NASCAR driver. Some people, it might be a musician. Um, I've got friends, you know, they go, if they get to a concert, they're like, oh, look, it's me and this person. You know, I met Stan Lee a few years ago, and that was me for like, an, like hey, hey, look, it's me and Stan Lee. Um, and I would do that all the time. We, we have people that we're excited to actually share about. Or... Uh, also, and I know some of y'all are in some different stages of life. Some of y'all get some grandbabies. And then all of a sudden, everybody you meet needs to see your grandbaby, right? Like, look at my grandbaby. Look at my kid. Look at this. A newborn, or, you know, parents of newborns are usually too tired to want to show anybody anything. Grandparents are all about sharing that. And a grandparent will share with you, oh, look, I got a newborn grandson, a granddaughter, stuff like that. They want to share it. When we actually meet God and he changes our lives, when we meet him, we want to share about him. We want to share that we actually met him and made contact with him and that he has changed us. And when he said this, uh, when God called out, who will go for us? Who can I send? Isaiah jumped up and he said, here I am, send me. Because Isaiah was ready to share with what God had done. Um, And y'all, when God changes our lives, we want to be that way. Now, David, uh, we're going to jump over to David real quick in Isaiah 50, or, uh, Psalm 51. This was right after David committed adultery, had someone killed, and then you know, lost the baby in the process. David had a real muck up of what his life was supposed to look like in his holiness. He failed completely. And look what it says here. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. David said, look, I know what it looks like to fail and receive grace. Restore me so I can bring other people that are wounded and lost and hurting to you. David was willing not to just, not to, David didn't just want to hide from his sin. He said, look, I'm coming before you, and I want to bring other people to this place of forgiveness. Because when we realize that other people need God's forgiveness as much as we do, we want to share it with them. And I'm not saying you have to harass people or beat them over the head with your Bible or anything like that, but we honestly want to share because God has changed our lives. We want to share because God has changed our lives. Isaiah 6, verse 9 and 10 says this. This is uh, Lord speaking to him. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the hearts, make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Now, We always hear that phrase of, here am I, Lord, send me. Y'all, this is the message he got to go send. He didn't get the the sassy, cool message that would be on Instagram. He got, he's like, y'all aren't going to listen to God anyway. He's like, I'm not even really here. Y'all aren't going to listen. You're not going to obey. You're not going to turn. You're just all stubborn, and your life's going to fall apart. That was the message he got to send. When God told him to send this message, we always think, oh, he got to go bring the good news of salvation. No. He got to say, y'all are stubborn, and you're not going to listen, and your life's going to be terrible. <laughs> y'all, do you feel like if you sign up to go do something, that's the message you want to preach? That's the message you want to share? Um, when our pastors are going over stuff, like, we all plan sermons together, but I don't get to pick which sermons I'm preaching. 
So like, I'll literally get a calendar of like, you're this Sunday, and I'll be like, oh, what? oh man, I got this one. And it's like, not that the Bible's ever bad, you know, but like some sermons are cooler than others, or some, you know, there's certain topics I want to talk about. And then I'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't want this one. Like, you know, it's not really something that happens that often, but like, it, it does. Um, and so like, we're seeing this, imagine, you know, that that's the whole message you got to preach of like saying, hey, y'all are so stubborn, nothing good's gonna happen in your life. Isaiah went and he did that because he was still willing to be obedient to where God was leading him. Now, one of the things is, y'all though, most of us, we get in a place where we only wanna share God with others when it's the warm, fuzzy stuff and not when it's the hard stuff. I'm not telling you you need to be in everybody's Kool-Aid and put a Bible verse under every sin that they commit on social media or, you know, put, you know, post-its of their sins on their workspaces or anything like that. What I'm telling you is this. If somebody asks you a hard question and you're not willing to actually share the truth with them, you know, we have to be willing to share the truth of God when it's hard, not just when it's warm and fuzzy. Now, I hate conflict. I hate correcting people. I hate anything like that. It is not in my soul to want to be that person. Yeah, I want to give everybody hugs and make them laugh and, you know, here's some jelly beans and just go on with my day. I don't want to do that. I want to have confetti cannons and be happy. Um, but sometimes you have to have conversations where you say, hey, what you're doing is not right and here's why, if you're asking me. What you're doing is, this is why you're not where you should be. Like, we need to be able to have those hard conversations because when we share with others, that's when God's life changes because, you know, we're not here to judge people, we're not here to condemn them, but the prophet's job was literally prepare the way, and you can't prepare people's way to meet Jesus if they're not willing to acknowledge what's wrong in their lives. Romans 10, 14 has this verse that says, how then can they call on the one who they have not believed, and how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Are we willing to, because of what God has done in our lives, actually be willing to go and share with others when he calls us to? God might call you to deliver warm, fuzzy messages, but reality is, if God calls you to have a hard conversation with a friend or family member, are you willing to have it? Are you willing to share because of what God's done in your life and you want to prepare people for doing this? When Isaiah was sent out to pre preach that message, he wasn't just there to condemn them. He was there to prepare them so they would actually be able to turn to God. And sometimes hard conversations are what actually gets us in the right place. And um, so Isaiah heard that message from the Lord. And so his response was like, well, how long are you going to do this, God? How long are you going to be against the people or make it hard for them? <laughs> so Isaiah 6, 11 through 13 says, then I said, for how long, Lord? <laughs> and he just straight up, he's like, well, God, how long is this going to go on? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined without an inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away from, into the land is utterly forsaken, even and, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid to waste. But at the terebinth and the oak leaves stumps, they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. He said, oh, I'm going to keep doing it until it's all gone. Again, not a happy message. Not a warm, fuzzy thing. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy this whole place because y'all aren't in a position where you can listen. And y'all, we don't want to hear this, but sometimes God has to destroy what we've built because we built something in his way. That it's in the way of us actually getting close to him, so he's got to tear it down. Um, whenever my kids have like a weekend off or we're not busy or something like that or they have sleepovers, they'll build these elaborate living room pillow forts. They'll rearrange the whole living room furniture, move all the couches, turn the couches upside down, have chairs sticking on top of it, and it literally looks like a jungle in the living room. And they'll build this thing, and they'll be really proud of it. And then I'll come home on a Sunday night or Saturday night, um, this all has to go. <laughs> it's like, I can't live like this. They're like, leave it up for a couple more weeks. No, not, this, this has to go. I understand you like what you built, but it's in the way. 
And y'all, sometimes what we've built in our lives, whether through sin, through selfishness, or sometimes even good intentions, can be in the way of us actually getting to where God calls us to. And Israel had been in a place of disobedience for a long time. But notice when he says when he was going to tear all this stuff down, he was going to plant a holy seed. He's saying, I'm going to destroy all this now so that holiness can grow in you later. I'm going to tear everything down in your current situation so actual life can grow in its place. And I'm going to tell you this, if God has to tear down something in your life, it's because it doesn't need to be there, but he's going to plant a seed of growth that he's actually going to grow something in the remains of what gets torn down. He doesn't just do destruction. He prepares for growth. He prunes. He prepares for growth. He, t- he turns the soil in our lives so we can actually grow. And everything that Isaiah was doing, even though it sounded like a horrible message, was preparing for what had to come so Christ come and bring redemption, bring forgiveness. Because he, Isaiah knew. Isaiah had a picture of the knowledge because he was a prophet. He, he wrote out this full description of what Jesus' life was going to be like, but he also knew at the end of, the time, at the end of everything that we were going to be judged and that we were going to need a Savior. And it was better for him to have a hard conversation then for us not to be able to meet our Savior later. It was better then because he knew what was coming. And, you know, as we see this, we're going to jump way far to Revelation. This is going to be our last scripture to share. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw the great white throne of him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, recorded in the books. Now, remember how I said we don't want to deliver hard messages, we want to avoid saying the hard stuff? I literally, reading through the message last night, was like, can I skip these next verses? These next verses are harsh, and I don't want to read them. I literally, after reading through this message about having to say the hard things, in my heart, I was like, I don't want to say the hard things. Can I cut this part out? Can I stop right there? I literally wanted to stop the verse at verse 12. I want to be like, um, I want to stop right here, because it gets And that's like, because I I was picturing this moment, I was like, can I stop right here? Is that okay? Am I going to get in trouble? I was like, will will the right message go out if I stop right here? And the reality is, I can't tell y'all to have the hard conversations if I'm not even willing to read the hard scripture, the stuff that's struggling. I want to tell you all this. Anytime we share hard truth in the right response, in the right place, it's out of love. Now, I'm sharing hard truth with y'all because y'all signed up for this. Y'all walked in here this morning and y'all sat down. The lady at Burger King, she didn't sign up to hear these verses this morning. If I go through the drive through hey, can I get an orange juice? By the way, you're going to be judged. She didn't sign up for that. Y'all signed up for this. This is on you. Um, Verse 13 goes on to say, it says, The sea gave up the dead dead that were in it, uh, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I was like, oh man, I don't want to say that this morning. But I'm going to tell you this. It might be, look like destruction now, but it's to build life and hope for the future. To say, yes, judgment is real, death is real, and if we don't know Christ, we're going to be in the wrong place. That's hard to say. I'm going to tell you this, it's the truth. And it's the truth because God loved us enough to give Jesus on that cross for us, and he loved us enough to have Isaiah go have really hard conversations. And I'm, the same conversation we have with you, if we don't actually meet God where he is in his holiness, we're going to face a judgment that we don't want because we're t- we would rather be comfortable than have hard looks at our own lives. So I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you. When you met God, did you actually see his holiness and did you see that your sinfulness and what did you do about it? Because if you met God and you are still comfortable with where you were in your sin, you're either lying to yourself or you're not really seeing who he is because his holiness changes us. 
That's one of the hard parts, y'all. I can say that, but I can also say that almost every biblical leader we see in Scripture met God and then was still stupid. Almost every biblical leader, literally, I mean, think about the people that literally were face-to-face with Jesus and still did nonsense. That, you know, Peter tried to tell Jesus how to be Christian. You know, he tried to tell Jesus how to be Christ-like and got called Satan in the process. That, you know, that Judas could literally be face-to-face with Jesus and still do what he did. But y'all, there's a lot of us. Here's what I want to tell you. If you have met Jesus and you're still choosing sin later on in your life, that doesn't mean that you didn't meet him. That means you probably need to meet him again. You need to get close to him again and see what that actually does for your life. When was the last time you actually marveled at his holiness? When's the last time you even thought about how holy God is? Because when we put that thought into our minds, it changes us. When's the last time you actually dealt with sin in your life? Not just said, God, I'm sorry, but you actually looked at the sin in your life and said, what do I need to do to change, to repent, to be where God's calling me to be? And when is the last time you actually intentionally shared the gospel with others? Not just the happy parts, the hard parts. Because listen, is the good news, but there's not good news if we don't acknowledge the bad news first. Otherwise, it's just all news. We need to acknowledge the bad news so that the good news is actually good news. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for being the loving God that you are and that you would look at us and you would love us. But God, when we see your holiness, it should change us. When we see your holiness, it should call us to actually live different. Not to put on a show or not to just be better because the world says we're better, but because your holiness should actually shine a light on us. And when we come before you, you actually purify what's burnt and ugly and broken within us. God, above all else, I just ask that you would help us to meet you if it's the first time or the hundredth time, that you would meet us because when we meet you, we are changed. God, I, that would, that's my prayer that for every person that's here in this room, for every person that hears this, wherever they are, that you would meet them and that they would be changed because of who you are. We love you, Father.